In the U.S., the average age for first marriages has risen, the marriage rate has plummeted, and the out-of-wedlock births remain sky high. At the same time, the movement to legalize same-sex marriage is gaining traction across the nation. Join us today as we talk about the nature of marriage, why it matters that marriage is under siege, and what we as Catholics can do to turn the tide. With us today is special guest Dr. Patrick Fagan, the Director of Marriage and Religion Research Institute at the Family Research Center. I'm Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Welcome to Franciscan University Presents. Today we'll be discussing why marriage matters. I'm your host, Michael Hernan, Vice President of Advancement at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. I'm joined here in our studios uh, by Dr. Regis Martin, Professor of Systematic Theology here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio, and uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, uh, the Father Michael Scanlon Chair in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization here at Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. And we're joined today with our special guest, Dr. Patrick Fagan. Uh, Pat, you've been a, an analyst in the U.S. Senate. You've been an assistant undersecretary at Health and Human Services on kind of family policy issues. Uh, you've been a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And now you're a fellow and uh, the director of Marriage and Religion uh, Research Institute at Family Research Council. So this is kind of your, your whole topic, uh, really, exactly. that you've spent a lot of your life looking at why marriage matters. So for an individual couple, um, when we're, we're talking about marriage, why does it matter that they get married? Why is a legal commitment uh, matter to us and to them? Well, I think it matters for almost all the human race because most of us desire and are called to express ourselves sexually. That's built into it's who we are. being human beings. But the only appropriate way to do that is within marriage. If you don't commit yourself to one, you're going to damage yourself, you're definitely going to damage the other, and you will damage, most likely, the offspring, mm -hmm. not just for one generation, but for multiple generations out. So the, the sexual is something to be channeled. It's very powerful for good, but it's a bit like atomic energy. It's mm -hmm. also very destructive if not properly channeled. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's something about the gift of sexuality that often you know, we, we miss it in our analysis that, you know, when it comes to eating, drinking, sleeping, these are strictly private things. And of course, sexual love is also. And yet, unlike eating and drinking and sleeping, there's something about sexuality that is ordered to the common good. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not only a private act, it's also a public service in as much as it's open to new life and raising up the next generation with this kind of interpersonal commitment. I think that has been somewhat overlooked but what's so interesting about your work, as I find it, is that your statistical analysis and sociological, psychological studies confirms what natural law teaches, as it were. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I would take it a little bit further. It was just occurring to me as Go you were speaking yeah. that not only is it private and then public and for the common good, but the marriage relationship, we are, let me back up one thing. Man is made in the image and likeness of God. God is a social being. It's the triune God mm -hmm. in constant intimate relationship. Marriage is that which calls us to an analogous intimacy. I'm not saying it's the same, it's not, but it's analogous. And it's where we are most social, we are social beings. If we're not social, we die, <coughs> literally. Um, and marriage is that which brings us in, and the marriage relationship is the primary social relationship for all mankind, for all societies, hmm. for all good that comes yeah. out of it. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, the phrase, to be is to be in relation to, I think, is given primary, profound sexual expression. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I like that, that image that you gave us at, at the beginning. Uh, sex is sort of like atomic energy. It's explosive, <laughs> it's radioactive, which means it needs to be controlled, domesticated, uh, lest it, it become a devouring fire and consume us. I mean, everybody knows uh, the story about the penitent who uh, is repeatedly uh, committing sexual sins, and he asks uh, Father Confessor, when might I expect all of these temptations <laughs> to end? And, and the answer, of course, is maybe five minutes after you're dead. <laughs> I mean, it's a sign yeah. of life. Yeah. This, yeah. This, this is the life force, eros. Yeah. Yeah. But it's got to be integrated. Yeah. And, and you talk about it as a, as a uh, protection of the individual, and you talk about it as children. Why does a, a marriage matter, particularly for children? What does that do for a child, from a sociological and, and some of your research as well? Well, I saw it as a, I was a therapist for about 15 years, uh, trained initially as a psychologist, undergrad with sociology. But in the first three years, without going through all the details, I ended up with, the, by the third year, I realized that children who were referred to me by GPs and pediatricians mainly, and most of them were in mid-childhood. You know, four to seven or eight uh, was the common age. And I gradually realized, actually, that by helping the couple overcome their conflicts, I didn't have to do anything with the child. Hmm. And the way I'd sum it up, actually, the strength of the, the child grows naturally. It's just like seeds in the ground. You give them sunlight and you give them the proper water, they grow. Right, right. Kids grow in the love between the parents. That's the natural soil for them. Yes. If the parents love each other and the kids see it, the kids are happy, they're yeah. safe, they know it. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're, and actually they're absorbing love just by osmosis. Mm. And, the, and actually this is one of the fault lines actually of male and female, particularly even very good couples, good Christian Catholic couples can fall into the danger of once they get married, and I think it could begin, particularly with the wife, that she'll begin to invest in the children more than she should. Yeah. You can invest as much as you can, but you've got to keep your primary investment with your spouse yeah. for your children's yeah. sake. Yeah. For your yeah. children's sake. That's right, as well natural, as for marriage. That's you know? the yeah. natural habit. I mean, I, I yeah. think. Uh, and for the guy, the default is to right. invest in the job. Uh, yeah. Particularly, actually, if the wife begins to withdraw from him, mm. he will find the consolation yeah. in his work. Well, and I think about uh, Father Terry, uh, University of President, often talk about how, you know, w we in our society today look for the habitat for the, 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 the red belly sapsucker and the, the, the spotted owl. We look for all the proper environment to raise these animals, but we don't think about what's the proper habitat yeah. for a human Yeah, kind of human marriage. ecology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like that insight. It, it, it is very shrewd that the children learn how to love uh, by watching their father love uh, their mother. Uh, and mm -hmm. that bond is primary, and it spills over. Uh, in fact, it, it co-creates that life. Uh, yeah. It makes and, a family. And all of the other virtues as well. I mean, it's not just the high virtue of love. It's, it's, it's loyalty. It's commitment. It's yeah. self-discipline. Right. It's self-denial. You know, the, um, the interesting thing in the last few minutes has been the, the change of roles, because I usually invoke the Trinity as the model <laughs> for the family. You know, and you would invoke the natural law. And here, here we've changed that. But it reinforces this sense, I believe, that uh, you know, you always hear this idea that the government has no business in the bedroom. And, you know, okay, there's a, there, it's obviously true at one level. Of course, we know it's not true at a deeper level because if a murder takes place in the bedroom or if somebody's doing drugs, selling drugs, whatever, you know, in the bedroom, oh, we can't do anything. It's in the bedroom, you know. Yeah. You know? Government has gone massively into the bedroom with right. massive destruction following it. That's right. And, you know, from a purely pragmatic yeah. standpoint, I mean, if you were an agnostic completely apart from God or the Trinity, I think you would look and see the common sense of what blessed John Paul once said, and that is the primordial human right that every person has is to be born from the love of your parents and then to be nurtured in that love. Because then and only then are all of the things that are properly human able to truly flower. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, the right to life and the right to the marriage of the parents are, are unlinked. You cannot unlink them. Right. You know, they go together. And actually, when the child is conceived within a marriage, it's highly protected, and the abortion rate is and pretty steady. The overwhelming, about 80%, this is a very steady statistic, uh, about 80% of abortions take place outside of marriage. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and what, when we look at um, 
outside of marriage, what, what are some of the impacts on having a stable marriage? What are some of the things that uh, lead to a, a real stable marriage then? Well, the impacts of stable marriage are universal. Mm. I don't know if they impact foreign policy, though I suspect they would, but on everything domestic, all domestic policy is massively impacted by marriage on every outcome measured. So if you were interested in the United States as a strong country or as a vibrant society, as everybody would for the common good, prime place, marriage, mm. comes even before, in the natural order, it comes before faith. I'm just saying in the natural order, <laughs> yeah, sure. because the child has to be conceived and born first. And then as the parents, right. for instance, in, in, for Christian parents, then the child is brought to be baptized but he's first a member of a family before right. he's a member of God's yeah. family. No, that, that's sound Catholic theology. Nature uh, uh, comes before grace, right. yes. and grace presupposes nature. It's got to be there. It has to be intact, somewhat healthy, so that it can receive grace, <laughs> supernatural yeah. life. And it's not rocket science that tells us that the family and marriage antedate civil society. Any societal arrangement uh, sort of presupposes the natural institution of a family, which begins with a couple of people falling in love. That's right. Yeah. 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 You can't yeah. legislate yeah. against that. No. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, I think we have to recognize that this, this all began to kind of get disentangled, um, or this, this got to get messed up way back before the 60s. I mean, oh, Chesterton yeah. has this line about when you trivialize divorce, you end up trivializing marriage. Right. You know, and so we don't have polygamy, and yet we do, serial polygamy. You could have many wives, but only one at a time, you know. And so when these things are being tinkered with, I think that uh, all kinds of forces are set in motion, you know, with respect to contraception, abortion, and then the definition of marriage itself, yep. it's up for grabs. That's you right. Know? Everything's on the table then, and everything's yeah. being chopped up. Yeah, and the it's weirdest divided. thing, the weirdest thing of all, I suppose, ends up being that the traditional definition of marriage is weird. You know, it's strange. I mean, it's, it's almost incomprehensible to young people to restrict people in terms of, you know, male-female relations as though that's the only way. Going back to a personal anecdote, actually, I used to be a therapist, and then what motivated my testing the waters of moving more into the public discourse was that I saw the effects of family planning on some of the kids and the families of kids that I was working with. And that be I began to realize, wait, now there's a massive insanity mm. going on in Congress. Yeah. And I'm in the insanity business. <laughs> I'm a shrink. <laughs> this is my business. They might, you made some help And this there. is the biggest insanity around there. And it li literally is. We, are we have gone insane mm. on matter sexual. Mm. Right. And right. we need in the, in the real cure. And the cure. destruction is increasing all around us. And, and the cure is, is a strong marriage culture in, in, in our, our society, a sense of... I suspect, and this is, I would hand it over to the theologians here. You see, marriage was one of those hidden gifts within the church as Western civilization was built. Mm. And we didn't realize the phenomenal gift that was empowering and strengthening individuals and societies and communities for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's only now with the withdrawal from Christianity you have a simultaneous withdrawal from Christian sexuality yeah. and from marriage. Yeah. And now we see the massive power that was there, the mm. power that was in that gift. So I suspect the restoration lies deep in the church and I suspect right at the Eucharist. Yeah, mm. yeah I think when, when we lived in a healthier age, marriages uh, were taken for granted. Family life right, was, yeah. was taken as a given and nobody questioned right. uh, or even explored uh, the beauty of it, uh, the distinctiveness of it. But as, as Yeats reminds us, things reveal themselves passing away. It's with the disappearance of right. healthy family life that we now find our, ourselves lamenting what we've lost and, and trying to recover a sense of that original uh, 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 inspiration that, that moved God to fashion human beings in families. Yeah. You know, it's only when Jesus elevated marriage to the level of a sacrament of the new law that uh, polygamy and uh, divorce and remarriage and, you know, all of the concessions that you find in the law of Moses that, you know, characterized even the patriarchs who, was, who were men of faith, you know. Right. It's only elevating it to the, sac to the level of a sacrament where you receive the power of the Holy Spirit 
you know, the sacrament doesn't make it easy. It just makes it possible to really be faithful in a lifelong, permanent, fruitful commitment. You know, you know what you reminded me of? There was a great thing in Ireland where there, there was a divorce referendum about 15 years ago. And a lady was interviewed, a good Catholic lady, and said, look, have you ever considered divorce? Her answer was, divorce? No. Murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we all know that there is some staggering statistics about marriage. Well, if you could just briefly discuss that just a little bit about what is the state of marriage in the U.S. today? Well, at Mary, we married, married uh, the Institute, we've uh, an index. What proportion of our 17 year olds at the end of their upbringing are still in an intact married family with mom and dad married? Only 45% of American 17-year-olds are in an intact. Less than half. Less than half. 55 have experienced their parents splitting. And then you go in for the black family, it's an absolute disaster. 16.8 last wow. year. Only 16.8 are with them. It wasn't right. always that way, though. No, in 1941, it was 90% intact. For African-American families. For African-American families. Oh, that's well, that is a catastrophe. Of this is a monumental proportion and explains most of the difficulties they're, going, they're in. Oh. Well, we have a lot to discuss here on why marriage matters. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. The ultimate goal of marriage is to get your spouse to heaven and not just to get yourself to heaven or to live a nice life or to have fun but really to love her so much to help her so much in what she is doing that she will be able to live according to God's will within a marriage if it's not going to be like all sunshine and roses but if there is like an argument or a fight like you can both um, go and just maybe have some personal prayer time and just have that time to really just be with God and within that the Lord will strengthen the bond the context of the sacrament is to remind us of the role that God plays in marriage, both how he's going to sustain us and give us what we need to reap the great benefits of what marriage should be, but also to remind us of how we're meant to hold ourselves to the standard of his love, try and live up to that great love that he has shown us in loving each other as husband and wife. I'm Dan McNally. I'm a theology major here at Franciscan University. I love studying theology. It's my passion. But, I mean, I love learning, too. You walk out of the classrooms, you want to know more. You don't want the lecture to end. So, I mean, that's a really great thing about being a part of a student body is you can continue to discuss outside. It's not just studying to, to make a grade. It's, it's learning to, you know, improve yourself. And not just through your own personal prayer or your own personal study, but through community, because that's what we're made for. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. We've been talking today uh, with Dr. Patrick Fagan about why marriage matters. Right before the break, we talked about some statistics. We talked about um, uh, that there was, is it 45% of seven, uh, those under the age of 17 are still in intact? No, at 17. At 17, they're still in an intact home. Yep. But then you talked about a staggering statistic. Uh, tell me about the, the black family, the state of the black family today. For the black family, as best we can measure it, at age 17, black 17-year-olds, African-American 17-year-olds, only 16.8% of them are in a family that's their mom and dad, biological mom and dad, married to each other. For the rest, they're in a family setting where mom and dad are not there, have rejected each other. Right. Actually, well, part of all of this, actually, there's either uh, the sexuality brings us together and we belong to each other, or gone wrong, it leads right. to rejection, and it's a deep rejection, mm. and it's devastating in its impact on men and women. You also mentioned this, this the uh, statistic before World War, oh no, after World War II? At what World War II, 1941, uh, the 41, yeah. black family was 90% 90, 90 intact. 90% of... 90% to 16. That's right, in wow. a period of about 70 years. Well, that was largely before the Great Migration up north from uh, the south. Well, actually, when you have migrations, uh, this, we, I was talking about this recently, the Irish migration prior to the famine here in this country oh. was devastating for the Irish family, absolutely yep. devastating. In Manhattan, 1820s, Manhattan, New York City is down at the bottom half of Manhattan. 
there were th about 30,000 Irish prostitutes in Manhattan. Oh, gosh. So you had sexuality gone berserk. Yeah. And you had drugs. So the drug of choice was whiskey. And oh. there was a corruption in there at the political, the Tammany Hall, the whole thing between pimps and bar owners that were really drug dealers. Oh, I see. There. It was yeah. awful. Yeah. So it's not just the black family. This can well, happen yeah. to any right. of us. Right. But what, let's look at some of the threats to marriage, and maybe even starting with that. I mean, uh, what, what, what happened with... Uh, well, the biggest threat to marriage, the big threat to modern marriage, is contraception. Mm. Uh, because it totally alters the nature of the sexual act. Um, even for married couples, they're essentially saying no to God. I do not want to be a co-creator. Yeah. There is no conversation between them. They stop conversing until maybe years later, maybe they want another kid five years later or three or whatever. And there's a blocking of the kid and a blocking of God simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. And that's gone deep. And then, of course, gradually, intergenerationally, with each generation, you see the sexual dumb down another level, another level, another level. As the kids grow up in an environment that's already polluted, when they become active sexually, they're going to take it to the next level, just by its, its natural law breaking down naturally. Okay. But even before the technological breakthroughs of the 50s and the 60s with the pill, Planned Parenthood was already active. I mean, mm -hmm. we were talking about the African-American family. I mean, you go back to the, the, the 30s and 40s, and wasn't Planned Parenthood involved in a kind of strategic policy? Yeah, they had... A, a policy of reducing births among blacks so that you would have fewer dysfunctional people. Yeah. And they targeted the black family first, and that's public knowledge, it's w well known, that was right. part of their thing. And of course the entree point into the black family was the black community, and the black community is led by the pastors and the church. So. You know, well-meaning, I'm quite sure the pastors who got into it were, couldn't foresee and thought, yeah, this is good. This woman has got too many kids and is leading her into poverty, so let's give her whatever the contraceptive of the time was. So it simultaneously corrupted the black church and the black family. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. And, and that's where I think the devastation comes in, is that they were targeted. There was, yes. this, there was a marketing and money and effort put behind this, but that happened um, I think it predates, you know, even... It happened in the 30s. Yeah. You could see the fruit of it definitely by the late 40s when the black family begins to break down. Mm. And then it accelerates the more this penetrates. And kids raised... There was a similar sexual revolution uh, freely undertaken uh, among Protestant whites. Mm. From 1930, you know, by 31 you had this massive sexual revolution. First was the universal rejection of contraception, and then by 31, and there on it just spread. And but it's an internal thing. <coughs> I mean, w within the Protestant tradition, you have you know this this Caucasian culture, you know, leading themselves into this. But what what, bo what what bothers me so much is about Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. There's a eugenic philosophy yeah. that we want to target this one subculture, African American, precisely because they didn't think that it was really equal. Right. And so let's reduce the family. You know, at a oh, time yeah. where the intact family, you say, was like 90%. Yeah. Uh, these kind of statistics, these kinds of results, you know, uh, and the strength would be that illuminating. marriage brings mm -hmm. economically, health-wise, education. Well, education, actually, you look at education today, um, and if you look at the sort of the the black family of the norm is almost a mother-led family without father. Right. Right. Yeah. right, yeah. And the girls, relative to the boys, are getting stronger and stronger, and the boys are getting weaker and weaker. Yeah. You see it in the education. But outcome. the white family and Hispanic families are in the same situation, maybe a half a block behind. Yeah, the, the, among whites, the belonging rate at 17, kids in intact families is 52, Hispanic it's 40. Uh, Asian Americans are the strongest at about 64. But yeah. 64 and declining. And even the Asian families. Yeah. 64 is about the, I don't know if you remember, Daniel Patrick Moynihan back in right. the Johnson days, his uh, study on the Negro family, yeah. raising the alarm. Right. The black family then was as intact as the Asian family is now. Yeah. Which is the strongest today. That's yeah. the strongest. That, that was a prophetic document when it came out and it raised a firestorm of, of controversy. Yes. Uh, I, I'm struck by this analysis uh, you have of, uh, of sexual experience that it brings people together initially. Uh, and with contraceptive uh, lovemaking there is 
a separation, a, a sundering. It, it literally shatters the unity uh, among sex, love, and life. Mm -hmm. and, and the results are disintegrating. It, it's sort of a centrifugal movement. Uh, and and it, it can't, we can't help but deplore that because it, it makes life uh, intolerable. Mm. You know, I have a controversial, but I think it's an insight that I've never backed away from and hold to. If you analyze, just think, even ontologically, yeah. what's happening with the contraceptive marital act, sexual union between married husband and wife, it is not that different. It is a bit different because the sex of the two partners are different, but it is ontologically almost the same right. as homosexual right. sexual acts. Yeah. Yeah. It's sterile. I wrote what, it's sterile. Right. The kid is not there. Right. It's there for the pleasure. It's not there for its primary purpose. Right. Yeah. And it's there for the, the meaning of sexuality, of the husband and wife expressing their love to each other. Sure. But that's vitiated underneath. Right. And essentially, they've, they've come to agreement between them. We will not be co-creators. Right. Yeah. right the, the ontologic of, of that kind of uh, sexual congress uh, is really no different from sodomy, and it's a sanction for it. They're indistinguishable. And I predicted years and years ago that the spread and the drive and everything else for homosexual marriage and for homosexual yeah. stuff will, will come right. because it's all growing out of this right. corrupted soil. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. W when you when you look at it, having also been in in government, um, do you believe our government's helping or hindering us in, in really establishing intact or strong oh. uh, marriages? Uh, hindering two big attacks on marriage. Uh, one most people have never seen it to be such was uh, Eisenstadt versus Byrd, a Supreme Court decision back in 1972, the year before Roe v. Wade, which had laid out actually most of the thinking that was used then in Roe v. Wade. But that was decision seemed like it was about contraception. It was the, what came out of it was the court granted the political right to singles to purchase and use contraception. Uh -huh. hmm. What that actually did in a much bigger way was it took sex out of marriage. Right, uh, right. Yeah. And that was, rather than protecting the fundamental institution of society, this was a massive attack. Right. The second big attack which f flowed out of that was family planning, yeah. which is a huge and f fills the coffers of uh, Planned Parenthood and a lot of the big companies that feed them and you know play off them. But that, um, you just see the fruits of family planning and look at the inner city because the poor are the main recipients of. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. I would say there's a third element though that, that, that has to be recognized as part of the judicial and legislative acts of government, and that is pornography. Oh. Yeah. The fact that right. pornography is just simply rampant and that this is a free speech right, or the, uh, the definition of how a community can set up standards is so That's arbitrary right. yeah. and so fluid that there's no way that you can really protect yourself. And even if you could, the internet just completely overwhelms. That's right. right. And this is about children. This that's is right. about protecting children. But adults also. And, well, of course, we all yes, need yes. protection on this one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly right. But it, but it, it destroys marriages, destroys and corrupts children. Uh, yet this is, as you say, going rampant throughout yeah. our culture. We had, just for the viewers, actually, we have a paper on the Mary website on that where we've synthesized all the research mm. on the effects of pornography on individuals, couples, marriage, kids. Yeah, because, I mean, sexually transmitted diseases pornographic addiction, these things are public health matters, you know, right, and yet they're right. treated as though they're strictly private matters for the individual. And, and I guess you know. now that we live increasingly in cyberspace, all of, all of the distinctions and hierarchies have been leveled. I mean, it used to be that you could, well, honor community standards in a place like Wichita. Yep. It's not Manhattan or San Francisco, but in fact, everything has been sort of uh, emulsified. It, it's right. one yeah. porn-fed public everywhere. So true. Everything has been brought to the least common denominator, allowing everyone free access on some crazy basis. And actually, it really undermines marriage and yep. its use. And I suspect, I don't have good data on this, but this is my interpretation of the, the science, that it's one of the things that's blocking men and women, oh, yeah. increasingly women are into pornography too, about, about one-third the rate of men, 
of them moving forward into marriage. They I was going to say, reason. it doesn't just hinder marriage. It, it renders people relatively incapable of entering into well, marriage right. Right. In, a, in a meaningful way. Well, that's right. Actually, it just destroys their desire. Yeah, the, right. Their desire for the woman <laughs> evaporates. Right. It, like, it right. kills any sense of mystery. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, people are reduced to parts in a machine that you sort of lubricate, and, and everybody is reduced to this common desire. Uh, and, it's, and you objectify the other. She or he is a thing, a boy toy, a girl toy, a commodity. Mm. I mean, that, that, that kills glamour, mystery, romance. It's and, no fun. And, and, if, and if we ended the program right now, you <laughs> might think there's a very dire and pessimistic view, uh, but you'll want to stay with us on the next part when we talk about rebuilding a marriage culture. Stay with us on Franciscan University Presents. It is a justice owed to children to have a mother and a father. And this is something that God has written into our very nature. We need both mother and father, and children deserve that. It's what's better for them, and it's better for the world. A lot of times in modern culture, we think of procreation as simply reproduction, just merely a biological reproduction of the species. But procreation is more the willingness to be mother and father together. Marriage is an experience of love between a man and a woman that can be witnessed and can be further experienced by their children. That's what's the value of marriage for society. It enables people to love each other and to show that love to their children. Those children are the future of society. If they're formed by a deep and obvious committed love, which marriage is, then they're going to be much better people, much better citizens, and only then are you going to be able to produce a good society. Explore the treasures of your Catholic heritage on a Franciscan University pilgrimage. Led by inspiring spiritual directors, you'll walk in the footsteps of saints and martyrs in the Holy Land, Poland, France, and Italy, and you'll deepen your love for Jesus Christ through daily mass, confession, prayer, and the joy of Christian fellowship. Let Franciscan University lead you on a pilgrimage of faith. Find out more at franciscan.edu slash pilgrimages. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, this entire program springs forth from the heart of Franciscan University. It's taped right here in our communication arts studio. Uh, our students are operating the cameras and the equipment. Uh, myself and Dr. Martin and Dr. Hahn are our uh, staff and faculty here at the university. Um, Dr. Fagan, we've been talking about why marriage matters. There's some, some alarming statistics, some, some daunting uh, uh, challenges that marriage has. But how do we go to uh, rebuilding a culture of marriage? How do we go to strengthening uh, our position? Actually, you go and you learn from those who are doing it well. <laughs> um, that's how it's, and you go to the church. The church's teaching is so beautiful. And, and as the nature of marriage has been explored more and more, there's a whole beautiful development of doctrine going on. So we can, we can be feasting on this. Um, I think in practical terms, couples have to, in going into marriage, realize they're in a culture now that is hostile, so they've got to take deliberately special care of building their relationship, not just through the courtship, which comes naturally, but after they're married and after, after the first child comes and leading up to the first child, thereafter, putting habits and patterns in place of mm. really taking care of each other. Um, and there's all sorts of guards they've got to put out around it. You know, they have to protect marriage. Government isn't doing it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to take on and the role yeah. of protector. Yeah. You know, I, I think that in order to counteract a culture of death, divorce, and disintegration, we not only need a culture of life, we need a subculture of life before we get to the culture, culture of life, life. you know. Because yeah. 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 we've yeah. got the church's teaching, we've got the new evangelization, we've got the sacrament of the Eucharist, we've got the sacrament of matrimony, we have a body of literature since Vatican II and beyond. We've got a body of statistical facts and studies and this sort of thing. But I think we also need mentors. You know, I, I think that we need models of marriage and family and, and not just isolated and not just sort of idealized or glamorized on TV or in some magazine. But in communities, you know, where a subculture can thrive, and here, here at Steubenville, Front Royal, Virginia, you know, the Benedictines out in Oklahoma, the, the communities near Thomas Aquinas College, there are many places in the country where Catholic subculture 
uh, a subculture of life and love, that's flourishing, you know, and I think we need that sort of thing, but it has to be more deliberate, yep. you know, so that the, these aren't just duets or trios getting together, you know, that there has to be a conductor, you know. This is where I think bishops especially and, and pastors of parishes also can really be encouraged, not just criticized for having failed, but encouraged, you know, outside the Catholic Church where there is much less good teaching, there can be some better systems, you know, marriage savers and the mentoring that can take place in individual parishes. And then over a 10 year time, you see a divorce rate that might have been 50 or 60 percent is completely reversed where it's down to 10 or 15 yeah. percent. We have a lot to learn from our separated brethren right. because they've learned so much from us That's about right. yeah. the covenantal <laughs> nature of marriage. You just touched on something that I don't think we talked about in our statistics. What is the, some of the statistics on those who are, are in, like what's the intact when you're religious or yeah. whether you're engaged, you know, have minimal sexual en or zero sexual Weekly encounter. mass. Yeah. You know. Well, the prime, on the human level, the primary one is chastity, mm. which actually begins really with parents raising their kids in modesty at, yes. the, at the first years, which later then becomes the protection of chastity. And then this idea you have of families being close together, being aware of it, building the subculture, where they have their kids play with each other um, during mid-childhood so that they just grow naturally into good friendships in the teen years. If you try to introduce them in their teens, they're going to say no. Right, <laughs> into yeah. But if they're already friends, it just happens naturally. Um, so chess, actually, there's the single most powerful chart I have in all of the social sciences is this one. We looked at women aged 30 to 44, 44 being the end of the fertile years with the data. Among those women, the level of intactness of marriage based on the number of sexual partnerships they've had in their life uh -huh. Among those who were totally monogamous, no sexual partner other than their husband, without anything and knowing anything about the men or anything, 80% of them in this age group are in an intact marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. here's the big statistic. With one extra partner, which for most women would have been prior to marriage, it drops from 80 down to 54. Yeah. With two, it drops down one. to 44. Oh. The ar so the protection, monogamy, chastity, right, all right. of that, which actually, if you look at the data then another way, those who have the most enjoyable, now, this we've got to get out, talk about positive. Right. Those who have the most orgasmic, the most enjoyable, the most frequent sexual intercourse, monogamous, weekly worshipers of God. There we go. Right. Right. Red, <laughs> Book, Red Book came out with this 20 years ago and startled the nation so the, the with the obvious. Have more fun. Oh, <laughs> have more fun. You, want, you want to have great sex? Right, yeah. Find a girl who goes to church weekly and marry right. her. Right. Or goes to church daily, it'll leave me a better. That's right, that's right. Well, yeah. so, and so what, we, what we're talking about is... Come to Steubenville and find a spouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you're talking about really is a way of life, a that's culture. Right. I right. mean, chastity not as an abstraction or a mere principle in the moral life, the but channeling. a way of life. Mm. And a personal habit, too, because... Right. There's nothing like marriage to bring about a personal exodus that draws you out of your so your right. own self enslavement, right. you know, right. where we're self worshiping wretches, you know, then yeah, suddenly right. we have to serve and yeah. sacrifice for others. You well, know? and I just have to point out something obvious here that that you're, you're a public public policy analyst, and and, and and when we looked at all the statistics, all the government, all the cultural influences, your your first response was, let's get back to the basics. Yeah. Let's build the family. Let's look at what the church, what the nature of marriage is, and and it takes this big macro problem and says, this is solvable. We right. can do it in our family. It, it, it's what Eric community. Gill called a cell of good living yeah. in the mm -hmm. midst of the chaos of our world. You, you have to you know, start small. You know, small well, is beautiful. That's right. And each, it's manageable. Right. And each one of us have to do that. Yeah. And we have to make sure our kids have the knowledge, right. at least. We can't bend their will, but we can induce them through love. Right. Truth and love, and yeah. they'll follow. Right? You know, Chesterton has a great point that if you live in a vicious age, uh, a discordant uh, and depraved culture, uh, there is a certain exhilaration in the pursuit of virtue. Uh, it, it sets you apart. It, it becomes an adventure. It becomes exciting. You're different. You're eccentric. 
and, and that makes you attractive. Oh, and there's a kind of joy that others are drawn to. Mm. Exactly. Mm. I think this is going to happen like in the early Christians when the pagans used to say, right. see how they love one another. Right, right. <laughs> that, yeah, that'll, yeah. that'll start. Yeah, it wasn't so much that they had read the creed and said, you know, this is coherent. <laughs> right. it, they had seen communities of Christians living the creed. It was embodied. It was a culture. That's a good way to harness the hormones of adolescence because when teenagers, you know, there's a temptation just simply to go with the flow. You remind them that that's, that's what dead fish do, you know. That's right. <laughs> but you can really, you can buck, you can swim against the tide, you can see this Appeal as an to adventure. Their sense yeah. of heroism. Well, exactly. and, and their sense of, of, of a revolution, a counterculture. Right. That Be rebellious, you know, right. a rebel with a cause. That's as, right. You know, my friend right. Dion puts it. You that's know? right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And actually, I think that adolescent age, young adolescents, when they become aware of the other the beauty, the, the guys becoming aware of girls, right, right. but immediately, I, I'm sure this is universal, you want to find the girl, right? the one whom you, and, and that's the great quest. Mm. But if you give yourself to some girl before marriage, you can never find, you can never give yourself totally to the girl when she shows up. You've already given part of yourself right, to someone right, else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think we also have to instill in our young girls and our young boys the fact that this is mutual. You know, oh, yeah. I think I grew up like a lot of kids thinking that we're the hunters. And then my, my wife reminded me, yeah, but we were the trappers. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's predatory on both levels. Yeah. You know? but, but I think there's something important there that even in our families, even today with all the gender confusion or, or gender, gender identity, the understanding of the, the, the complementarity and the differences of, yeah. of the sex. And the beauty of those differences. Beauty. Yeah, yeah. And, right. that, and that's a true thing that they learn in the family. They see that's that right. first yeah. in the home. I mean, all of those things that, that we as parents have greater control over than government, than the, than the media, than anything else. At that, that point in their life, we're helping form that. So I think we, it, what you're saying is, is that we have the power within oh, yeah. uh, our own families to change that. And I think actually that married couples have to step up at the parish level because, mm. you know, poor priests are massively overworked. Um, and I'm quite sure they say, please, <laughs> please yeah. step up, do this, help us on this, to get those yeah. what do you call it, ministries within the parish here the, the permission has to be given, the encouragement must come from, from the bishops and the priests, but the actual doing will primarily come from married couples. Right. So is it, that what they should do, Wes? Is that what the sh church should do, is just encourage that sort of marriage? I won't tell the church. Yeah, I mean, the, the <laughs> that's, that's beyond my I mean, we, we, need a, we need a catechesis, but not yeah. exclusively at the level of grace. I think people need to be oh. instructed about nature, the exigencies right. of nature, what, what we might call the syntax of sexuality. It involves a man and a woman, and there is a certain naturalness to that that's attraction. Right. You know, uh, Ortega y Gasset, in, in that really pioneering work, The Revolt of the Masses, way back in 1930, he identified, he fingered the nature of barbarism as the tendency to dissociate, to split apart. And, and that's exactly what divorce is. And that's what the sexual revolution has ushered in. We treat one another as strangers, you know, anonymous sex. Maybe after a week or two, I'll learn your name. But uh, that, that, that is a recipe for, for chaos and, and, and uh, despair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, th there is something about concupiscence and there's something in concupiscence that gives us a blind spot when it comes to the sexual dimension. I mean, the fact is, if we were simply concerned about mental health in a, a proper way, a as well as public health, you know, as we've seen, we would, we would see our government rallying behind the church That's right. to do this sort of thing. That's right. But it's not just a blind spot. It's a blind spot. I, I used to have migraines as a teenager, and I would start with a blind spot that kept growing, you know, until, you, I, until I lost my peripheral vision. You know, that's something analogous here, because I think what we have to do is point out to our young people the obvious absurdities when it comes to sexually transmitted diseases. Why aren't, you know, the, the public health officials doing more with that? Because it's something that's off limits, yeah, you know. It's taboo. Yeah. 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 And this is just so it it's the eight hundred pound gorilla in, in the, the room. room. Yeah. I mean I mean every issue comes okay. back to this. I mean right. we're all exercised about gun control and perhaps rightly so. But if you fix the family then you fix everything else. Well, why isn't Obama focused on this instead of having his wife go after people oh. who eat too many hamburgers? I mean, I, we're talking about the breakdown of a family. Yeah. 
No, I think President Obama knows exactly what he's doing. That's another topic for another thing. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's funny because I, I'm reminded of, you know, the, the, the world will say, oh no, it's the church. The church is hung up on sex, not American culture, not Obama, not the, not the politicians. You know, the, the old story of the, the psychiatrist who was showing Rorschach, administering the Rorschach test, the ink blots to this, this, this patient. And he's describing all of these ink blots in terms of sexual perversions. And finally, the shrink says, it's obvious that you have some really, you know, immoral problems. He said, what, me? You're showing me the dirty pictures. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, our culture is hung up, but they accuse us, uh, yeah, you know, the, the right. church of, right. and yet it's the liberating power of truth and love. Actually, the, if you take the primary institutions, the basic irreplaceable ones in all societies, all of history, you've got the family, the church, religion, school, marketplace, and government. And if you take all of those, and you do it, everything eventually funnels down to the family, to marriage, and the tipping point at the end is the sexual act. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what starts it all. That's what starts it all. And that's where it all goes wrong or goes greatly. Right. But right. always has. One of the great things, our Lord first began to reveal his divinity, I think, to the woman at the well. You know, he began to unfold it a bit. She already had, you know, she was way out on my chart, you know, from right. <laughs> going from 80 down to 50, 40, 40. She was over here. And so he's very forgiving of this, but always yeah. very firm, very understanding, mm. right. fallen human nature. We seek love in sex mm. yeah. rather than... The, you know. yeah. That's a yeah. good picture, too, because when you look at the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, who's had five husbands, mm. and compare her to Nicodemus, the Pharisee in John 3, He's still blind, but she's thirsting. Yeah. Right. You know, and this is where mercy comes in yeah. because you know, we're not looking for people who've never fallen. We're looking for people who will admit that they have and who need mercy and know it and will ask for it. Yeah. Which is probably near everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we all oh, need it. That is right. so true. I mean, Jesus doesn't moralize in, in that parable. He no, doesn't no, instruct right. her and say, you're a slut. You need to get some sexual hygiene. No. He, he offers her life, everlasting life, and waters hope. that will never, never uh, deplete. Amen. Well, stay with us for our final segment here on Franciscan University Presents. Christ himself, when he, talk about, when he talked about marriage, uh, he makes reference to uh, the Mosaic Law. And Moses said that um, there are various different reasons that one could divorce their wives. Uh, but when Christ comes along, he says that uh, you can't divorce your wife because um, like what, what God has joined, let no man tear asunder. Um, and it says that, that that bond made between man and woman um, through the conjugal act is so, um, so penetrating. Uh, it goes through into their souls and it links them. Uh, so it says the two become one um, and they're united. And through that unity, a new life is brought forth. And that life is a human soul. When a couple gets married, they love each other and they say to each other, I commit my life to you. But when a couple cohabitates, they claim that they love each other but there's no commitment. It is so great because it refers to or symbolizes the great love of God for humanity. And so we're going to be enabled with God's grace to do something great, namely have a marriage, but then also point to something greater, namely his love for us. Develop the business and leadership skills you need to get and keep the career of your choice. In an ever-challenging job market, an MBA can make all the difference. Move your career forward with a master's in business administration from Franciscan University of Steubenville. My name is Joseph Frelich. I'm a chemistry major, biology minor here at Franciscan University. I love the atmosphere. It's completely centered around the Catholic faith. When I play soccer, when I'm in classes, everything is, has that same Catholic attitude. Myself and a few other chemistry majors had the opportunity to work with top scientists in order to combat neglected diseases. I was able to connect my love for chemistry and also my love for mission work by synthesizing chemical compounds. Franciscan University is academically excellent and passionately Catholic. Welcome back to Franciscan University Presents. Uh, today we've been talking about why marriage matters. This is our segment to do our, our final thoughts and summation and highlights. Regis, did you start us off? Yeah. Uh, 
Pat, thank you very much for coming. Uh, it, it's been fascinating, but also pretty depressing, <laughs> I, I think. But uh, let me continue that uh, in that same vein of depression. Uh, as a clinical pathologist, uh, let me present a sort of snapshot of, of the world we have lost uh, and, and then ask you and the others, how do we recover something of, of its health uh, and, uh, and wholesomeness? But it wasn't so long ago, it seems to me, 50 years perhaps, that a man walking out on his wife and his kids was doing something obviously immoral. And it, it proved socially ruinous uh, if he did that. And I think of Nelson Rockefeller back in the early 60s. He was governor of New York. He had presidential aspirations. And then he divorced his wife of 20 years. And he married a, a much younger woman who I think conveniently divorced her husband. And they had lots of kids and they married. And it undermined his credibility. He wanted to be president. The Republicans at, at the convention in 64 were, were, were shocked, scandalized by this. And he committed political suicide. He had no future in, in presidential politics. If you flash forward you know, another 50 years, you've got a guy, I won't name him, but he's had a number of sexual conquests, uh, conjugal uh, trophies, four wives, and he's taken pretty seriously. And whatever impediments he had, it wasn't uh, marital. What happened? I mean, the hot button issues of the 19, early 1960s were not abortion, divorce, pornography, homosexuality. I mean, gay marriage would have been unthinkable, inconceivable. Nowadays, uh, you can't get elected to public office. You can't make a movie in Hollywood unless you pander to the gay lobby. What the hell has happened <laughs> to this country? And how do we restore not, not just sanctity, but basic sanity? I mean, that's the challenge. God. <laughs> I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to even try to. But you know, it's, it's fun for me because I've known you, Pat, for 20 years. And I, I always like to get back together because you give me this healthy dose of your Irish wit and optimism, you know. <laughs> and even when you give statistics that lead us to kind of uh, pessimistic conclusions, I think your disposition, not only personally, but also professionally, and what you've been doing now for years is sort of shining a light in a dark place. And even if the darkness is increasing, it makes the light shine all the brighter. And so whether it is looking at the statistical outcome of all of the sociology, or if it's just reminding us of the Eucharist and the sacrament of matrimony, you know, I would say that the, the baseline for me is people like you, people like us, who are struggling you know, with sin and selfishness to get more grace through the sacrament of confession. Now we hear frequent the sacraments, but there are only two sacraments that you receive frequently. Besides the Eucharist, the other one is confession, and we need that. And I would just say for mentoring to take place, for models of marriage and family life to really happen, the only way is for men to be honest with themselves, admit their weakness, and come back again and again for grace, for mercy, for the sacraments but also to get together and encourage one another in parishes, in prayer groups. Uh, I've been to a number of, of men's conferences in Phoenix and in Miami and in Michigan, and where hundreds, and in some cases thousands of men are together. And you know, if they're gonna pretend to be something they're not, it's a waste. But if they're gonna acknowledge the fact that they are men in need of mercy, and that that grace is gonna transform them and send them home to be recommitted to their wives and kids, then I think we've got a lot more light than I would have thought maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So I just want to say keep up the good work yeah. and thank you for it. Mm -hmm. Pat. Well, I think the, uh, to answer Regis's question, uh, marriage and the culture that protected and had it, the culture of 50, 60 years ago that you were talking about, was the fruit of the church's gift of itself to Europe, Western civilization and growing out beyond the West. Um, and the rebuilding of such a culture will happen the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's our, our vocation for most of us is a vocation to marriage. So what our Lord is really calling us is be faithful. Mm. Yeah. And don't worry about the fruit. Yeah. Be faithful, the other will come. Mm. And it's if we are and rediscovering and the call to marriage. It's a tough call, yeah. even in the best of times, as yeah. that Irish woman said, <laughs> murder, maybe. <laughs> um, that is where the future lies. 
in us finding our vocation and living it to the full, which really means in marriage, and I've still got a long way to go, where you, you lose yourself yeah. in giving yourself to the other, saying no to yourself to serve the others more and more and more. And that's what builds first a culture of marriage right within your own family. And that's the first place to build a culture of marriage, right there. And then with others who are interested in the same, and then out. I think that's the future of the church. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It is the future of the church. The church actually vocations to the priesthood and the religious life, primarily and overwhelmingly, come out of good marriages. They don't come out of contracepting marriages, I can right. tell you that right. for a certainty. Yeah. So the church needs this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The world needs it. The world needs each one of our marriages being fully itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's inspiring. Yeah, that is powerful. Well, um, Pat, thank you for being on our program today. Uh, this has been uh, daunting in looking at the challenges, but then really inspiring on the fact that we all, whether we're priests, whether we're lay, whether we're single, we're married, we have a stake in marriages, that our society and our children um, and, and us as persons need marriage. Marriage matters to all of us. So thank you for kind of laying out a great vision. If you uh, enjoy today's topic, um, we have a download for you. Uh, this is a, a speech uh, Pat gave at the World Congress of Families, um, the, the culture class, sexual monogamy uh, versus polyandry. Um, this will be available at faithandreason.com or um, just giving us a call. Um, when we look at marriage, it, it is very, very uh, difficult to look at. Uh, so many of us have uh, no friends or have come from uh, broken homes or, or have had troubled marriages. This isn't something that is, that is new in the world. It's since the world began. Uh, but as Scott said and as Pat said and Regis, we need um, our Lord. We need the Eucharist. Uh, we need confession. And with God's grace and His mercy, we can rebuild uh, this culture. But I think if we try to fix the whole world, uh, we, we will fail. But if we focus on that which is right in front of us, uh, uh, last night uh, during your talk, uh, Pat, to um, uh, the students, you talked about how we, if we love God and love our neighbor, the two greatest commandments, uh, it's, it's, it's in giving of ourselves in our marriage that we are going to restore our culture. But that's what our culture is trying to do, reduce our ability to worship God and love our neighbor, which is our spouse or our children. Uh, and this is a beautiful thing. So we can embrace this and change the world uh, through our marriages and our families. So uh, Franciscan University, uh, is, uh, is whole mission is built on going out and forming the students who are transforming the world. And I want to invite you uh, to be a part of our mission, to be a part of our life, to be a part of this renewal of the church. Uh, possibly by getting your degree here on campus or through our distance learning or on learning programs. Um, or come and join us at our summer conferences. They are great dynamic programs where you'll be inspired and educated and sent forth in a whole new way. Um, or go to our, our, our website that we launched, faithandreason.com. There's great videos from Regis and Scott and, and Pat and so many others uh, to be really inspired and engaged so you can go out for the new evangelization to really change our world. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, this has been a program uh, that really cuts to the heart of who we are as a society. Family is the building block for our society, and you can make a difference. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Thank you. To download the free handout on today's topic, go to faithandreason.com. Email your request for the handout to presents at franciscan.edu. At faithandreason.com, you can also purchase past episodes of Franciscan University Presents, or request today's free handout and purchase past programs by calling 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357.